So let me welcome you here, distinguished guests, former Dean Charles. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 37th Annual Ford CE Reed Lecture. Let me open the lecture by acknowledging that we stand on traditional Mi'kmaq territory. I'm Kim Brooks, the Dean here at the Shulman School of Law. It's a great pleasure to be able to say a few introductory words about this lecture and about this year's speaker. The Reed Lecture was established to honor the memory of Horace E. Reed, who was Dean of the Law School from 1954 to 1964. The lecture was established as a joint project between the Reed family and the law school. Dr. Reed's son, Dr. Robert Reed, <laughs> is with us today. And welcome, sir. Horace Reed served this country in many ways. He served in the First World War, was chair of the Regulations Revision Committee, Royal Canadian Navy during the Second World War, was a longtime member of the Nova Scotia Labor Relations Board, a longtime member of the Conference of Governing Bodies of the Legal Profession, a longtime member of the Conference of Commissions on the Uniformity of Legislation, honorary president of the Nova Scotia Barristers Society in 1966-67, and Canadian delegate to the Conference on Private International Law at Hague in 1968. At the law school, he's touted for his scholarly achievements, for his ability to teach, and for his superb administrative skills. In recognition of his exemplary life, Dr. Reed was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada in 1973. His other honors include honorary degrees from Acadia, Queens, Dalhousie, and Windsor. In commenting on his remarkable life, let me borrow from two paragraphs of a lengthy editorial of March 1st, 1975, in the Halifax Herald. Horace Emerson Reed, OC, OBE, QC, BA, LLB, LLM, SJT, LLD. <laughs> oh, you gotta get a list of those. <laughs> Former Dean of Dalhousie Law School and a legal scholar and legal teacher of international renown, was in the great tradition of deans at Dalhousie. In many respects, he exceeded the talent and distinction of his predecessors. Horace Reed taught law, certainly with all the authority of a profound and mature scholar of international renown, but he also brought to his teaching the benevolence and humanity which were among his most admirable qualities. Kindly and affable, readily available to students and colleagues alike, by whom he was held with great respect and affection, he presided as dean over a lengthy period of unparalleled expansion and the development of the faculty of law, and marked it firmly with his personal philosophy and objectives. Welcome to the Reed Lecture. This year's Reed Lecture, The Utility of Law and Literature to Legal Education, will be given by Professor Melanie Williams from the University of Exeter School of Law. Professor Williams read law at Cambridge. She has a postgraduate certificate in education and a master's in English literature. She's a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Professor Williams has a long list of publications, including among them two books, Secrets and Laws, Essays in Law, Life, and Literature, and Empty Justice, 100 Years of Law, Literature, and Philosophy, Existential Feminist, and Normative Perspectives in Literary Jurisprudence. She has a long list of articles and book chapters to her name, most of which draw on her interest in the use of language and literary devices in law, and that draw on her insights and the insights that interdisciplinary studies generally can offer. With that too brief introduction, let me turn the podium to Professor Williams. Please enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to, first of all, thank you all very much for inviting me here today. Thank you to Dean Brooks and to the Reed family and to Shulik, all at Shulik and Dalhousie. Um, I realise that being invited to give the Horace E. Reed Memorial Lecture is a real honour. He was clearly an inspiring man with a wide array of interests and a range of topics from law reform to conflict of laws, labour law and legal education. So I've been asked to speak to one of those interests and uh, um, given my love of law and literature I thought maybe legal education uh, was a clear connect. So I'm going to um, explain to you a little bit about how I understand law and literature and I'm drawing quite a lot on my own work I have to say rather than anybody else's. Um, uh, I, I teach a course in law and literature at Exeter University. There's only about five law and literature courses uh, in the UK, to my knowledge, um, at different law schools. And I think ours is the, the, the biggest, the most successful. I've spoken to other uh, uh, law and literature teachers elsewhere. I may be wrong, but um, we have around about 120 students out of 
we have a, 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 a student body of about a thousand students in our law school, so it's not a big law school, it's not huge. We have an intake of around about 300 undergraduates per year, and uh, we had 120 take law and literature last year, which is good for an optional subject. And I've been encouraged to um, expand the course, which I, I'm going to do, and I might have a chance to tell you a little bit about that. So, um, just to, to explain a little bit to you then about the field of law and literature, um, you'll see in a lot of texts about it that some commentators suggest that the field is best understood as splitting into two distinct approaches, law in literature, and the law as literature. Um, and I've said that, I, mean, I've, I don't want to keep reading you the text, but you can see for yourself in this slide, legal writings, as we all know, can be read as literature. Le legal writing is a rich source of um, 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 linguistic um, um, creativity, and uh, you can see law itself as a source of literature. Um, and so that's true. And it's also true that a lot of law and literature writing is about the law in literature. So people tend to ask me whether I've written about Dickens' Bleak House or Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment. There are certain sort of flashpoint uh, topics that people associate with law and literature. And it's true that those things are there. But um, this is limiting because there's a danger, and this is a warning to anyone who wants to undertake law and literature research, there's a danger that if you pick a text which is overtly a law and literature text uh, that has an overt um, um, legal subject in it, like the Court of Ch Chancery in Bleak House, for example, you run the risk of simply describing rather than analysing and critiquing um, the content of that text. So you're sort of mirroring in some way rather than digging. Um, and uh, in my experience, it's much... Uh, more helpful to look for the potential for triangulation by um, letting the text speak to you. I have to say that most of my law and literature work has sprung from a very, very powerful and passionate love of literature that I have. I mean, good literature, when it gets you, you know, it, it's visceral. A great poem or a great text absolutely grabs you with a truth that you probably can't find anywhere else and you might not find it in a legal text ever at all. So triangulation is, is a way of thinking about it. So um, you can combine uh, a literary and a legal theme with uh, legal philosophy, psychology, economics, and, um, and, and then see how that uh, draws out the critique. Um, I'm just going to get um, a bit of a red herring out of the way here because, um, and this tends to be more for non-lawyers rather than lawyers, so maybe it's a, we can run over this quickly, but people sometimes say, oh, law and literature, that's thinking about legal fictions then. And um, I'm sure you'll all appreciate that it's, it's not um, about that at all. Um, legal fictions, as I've said here in this slide, are um, a, a not very significant um, kind of um, artefact. And um, as I'm sure you all know, a common example of a legal fiction is a corporation uh, which ascribes personhood <laughs> to um, um, corporate entities for matters of convenience. Um, there is, uh, I found on the wiki site, I'm quite unashamed of using a wiki site, there is a, 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 a literary text that draws on the idea of the legal fiction uh, by H.G. Wells. And um, as this slide shows, he he actually misunderstood it anyway. So um, uh, he um, has this scenario where um, Peter's parents die in a sailing accident. As it's not known which parent dies first, a legal fiction is applied maintaining that the husband being a man and therefore stronger live longer. This results in the father's will determining Peter's legal guardian. However, later in the novel, a witness to the accident declares seeing the mother um, um, drowned first. And so the legal fiction is overturned and the mother's will is followed, providing Peter with a new legal guardian. Um, but actually, English law presumes that the older person died first anyway, so it's completely based on the wrong kind of assumption about what the legal fiction was. But I thought I'd better just get that out of the way. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so for me then, the relevance of fiction in doctrinal law is not so much in relation to the idea of legal fictions, 
but it's related to a fact not very well acknowledged in law at all. If you think about how we use the doctrine of precedent, how we use a line of cases to uh, make associations and create a narrative of coherence, um, and we often talk about law as having a kind of forensic scientific capability, um, and actually the word narrative is a dirty word really to lawyers, it sounds way too arty and vague, so you don't hear judges talking about the narrative very much, um, not in that sense. And when you think about what happens with uh, the doctrine of precedent, it's often quite a crude and primitive um, process to draw together those precedents in that way. Another reason why I think there's a good connect between law and literature is um, because law often constructs um, an ideal subject, talks about the reasonable man or the characteristics of the legal person, for example. Uh, and makes demands on the legal subject as a result of that construction. But um, there's a nice quote here um, from a writer, Stanowski, talking about Freud, who said that the ethical demands made by society on the individual seem to have little regard for whether it's possible for people to obey them. And I think that's a really profound insight about what we do to people in the law. We, we impose upon them a model of um, humanity that it's very, very difficult sometimes to live up to. And we may do that for pragmatic reasons, but the fact is, if in a deep sense of deep truth, that's making a demand greater than an ordinary, fragile human being can meet, then, um, uh, then that's clearly problematic from a moral point of view. I've referenced here um, an article I wrote about this a couple of years ago, called The Normal Man Hardly Exists, where I looked at uh, the constructions of uh, the human being, the legal subject, in cases and, uh, and in popular culture as well, and in literature, but mostly looking at the way uh, the normal man is con construed through uh, psychiatry, psychology, and psychoanalysis, uh, which is very interesting because there's a kind of hierarchy of professions there. Um, clearly the law is very ready to acknowledge the authority of a psychiatrist but not quite so confident of a psychologist and, and for, for some good reasons very wary of psychoanalysis. Um, but there are great um, insights there that demonstrate the fragility of the human subject. So the ideal subject and the actual factual subject, there can be quite a mismatch there. And the quote, by the way, the normal man hardly exists, is from Dostoevsky's crime, crime and Punishment. It's the doctor at the end of the novel who is making a comment about, again, something very profound for us as lawyers, the fact that um, normality is actually rare. So it turns on its head the kind of statistical associations we have with um, um, normality and peripheral behaviours. Um, here's another source that I've come across in my, in my readings as well that helps to demonstrate why there's a connection between law and narratives and fictions. This is actually a quote from uh, a, a, a wonderful writer called Abby Stein, who is a psychotherapist working with um, convicted offenders. And she talks about the difficulties of pinning down factual accounts, the accounts that the law claims it can um, um, capture um, in, in legal cases. I've, I've referenced there the Saatchi case. I don't know if you followed the Charles Saatchi case a few months ago where he grabbed hold of our rather beautiful uh, television chef's face, uh, Nigella Lawson, um, and um, stuck his finger up her nose and then put his hands around her throat in a public restaurant in, in uh, London. And he claimed, he put a construction on that that was sort of very dismissive and, and it, you know, it wasn't a problem at all. That's just the way they playfully behaved to one another. Uh, but it was a very shocking piece of film and, and photography, actually. So just referencing the fact that when you talk about factual accounts, you can have multiple accounts, as we all know as lawyers. And, and feeding into that, the way people reconstruct their narrative accounts of their own behaviour is often wildly at variance with what logic tells you about those circumstances. 
So when Stein, uh, the um, psychotherapist working with convicted offenders, makes this comment, um, she's re recognising that, that people construct masks which they believe in. I mean, we, we construct selves all the time. We construct selves that we feel are acceptable to our inner identity and to our public identity. And then we will often have to um, um, make those marry up um, and, and alter our understanding of um, events and our actions <coughs> particularly, because it's actions uh, that in the end matter to the law more than anything, um, which are wildly at variance. Um, and one of the points she makes too about these confabulating behaviours in offenders is um, that they are often uh, meeting the gap between their vision of themselves and their actions when their actions have often resulted from a limited uh, vocabulary and a limited education. So the idea is that um, when you've had um, a disadvantaged background, you may well act um, improperly, act impulsively, aggressively and so on um, because uh, you simply don't have the words to find your way out of that situation and to reason your way out. So some very interesting uh, thoughts there on relationships with fiction from uh, psychoanalysis as well. Um, but going back to literature, um, you can um, think about reconstructive and deconstructive accounts of facts and looking at literature can help you towards thinking how that might be done. I've referenced in this slide here uh, the three trial narratives example, which I might have a, a chance to tell you about later, but I've written in the past about a text that we're going to be looking at in a minute, Tess of the Durbervilles, and, uh, um, Tess of the Durbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Uh, and I looked at Tess of the Durbervilles and the law of provocation um, relating uh, her story um, to uh, the doctrine of provocation in, in the law of homicide and the law of murder. And in order to understand that, I mapped three different trial narratives onto her story. So one would have mapped um, what we would, would have known that classical doctrine would have made of her facts. Uh, the second trial narrative mapped onto her facts what our modern sort of contemporary doctrine would have made of her facts. And then the third trial narrative allowed Hardy's narrative to dictate, I mean, I used myself as his kind of amanuensis, allowing him to dictate what he was trying to tell us um, about the situation of someone so positioned and how we might reconstruct the narrative, the legal narrative of the doctrine from that point of view. Uh, we might be able to catch up on that later. There's been writing too in Canada. There's a very good journal of um, comparative uh, um, disciplines and literature called Mosaic, which some of you may be aware of. I think it's based in Winnipeg. Um, and um, some writers have written there quite a lot about uh, trial narratology as a discipline, analysing the way narratives are, are constructed and deconstructed. There's some very interesting work there. The way advocates create kernel and satellite accounts of the same facts, which are, of course, dramatically divergent. And the way they also manage chronologies in presenting cases at trial. So you will foreground certain facts, but you'll also slow down your account of the facts if you want to foreground it. And if you want to background it, if you're the defence lawyer and want to make less of that shooting incident, you'll speed it up. So uh, there's some very interesting work done on uh, the narrative aspect of this. Um, my experience of teaching law and literature to students and of, of reading and thinking about it myself is that um, law and literature studies brings... Uh, the actuality of doctrinal formulae and of their impact to life more effectively than case law. As we all know as lawyers, what tends to happen is that uh, case law um, cleanses, um, kind of anaesthetises us from the essential drama and emotive elements and sometimes a deep truth about um, um, the facts of the case. 
I've mentioned Ed Dworkin's chain novel because, of course, his model of law as integrity suggests that um, um, the doctrine of precedent is like the building of a chain novel with uh, people handing on um, very faithfully their account of how to read these certain sets of facts onto the next chapter writer, and that's how precedents are built. Um, I would suggest to you the problem with that, as we know, law sometimes gets stuck in an account of how it understands uh, a certain human behaviour. It can get stuck for generations, in fact, to the detriment of the legal subject. And, and so it, it's not so much, in fact, a genre. I should have said a sub-genre. You know, you can get stuck in a certain sub-genre of, of, of artistic development, and then it takes a revolution to break out of that. So um, that's another thought to bear in mind about it. I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about the course I teach in law and literature, in case any, anyone here is interested in ever teaching it or thinking about how to teach it. And I've actually been invited uh, to a couple of other universities recently to spill the beans about how I teach it. Uh, the universities in the UK who are looking to broaden their market, I think, um, and, and, and get in more students from other disciplines. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm not proud. I'm, I'm happy to sort of flog it on to whoever's interested in hearing about it. Um, so we, we, I've based the course. I've actually got an, a new younger colleague coming in now and teaching it with me. But for years I've been teaching it on my own. And we start with the children's book Where the Wild Things Are, um, which I show on the big screen. You know, there's wonderful big illustrations by Maurice Sendak and kind of almost tell the students to put their thumbs in and settle down and let me read to them. <laughs> And um, the choice of each text, by the way, is dictated by two things. Up until now, I've been teaching this as a 15-credit, one-term module. So we have to get through it fast, but deep as well. So I choose texts that we can access very readily and, and manageably. I don't expect people to read enormous tomes when they've got lots of other core law courses. And I know law and literature is a bit of a fun kind of peripheral activity for many of them. Um, but th so that's one factor. The other factor that dictates the choices is to ensure that there is at least one published critical article um, that references that text that is a law and literature article. So with Where the Wild Things Are, I don't know if any of you remember Des Manderson. Um, um, he, he was a, a research professor here in Canada until a few years ago. Um, and he's now back in Australia, but he wrote a wonderful paper called From Hunger to Love, all about uh, critiquing where the wild things are. So that I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then the trial scene from The Merchant of Venice. By the way, I use DVDs a lot, so we watch the trial scene from The Merchant of Venice, and then the students have the transcript of uh, the trial scene. Of course, we go over a uh, sort of overview of the entire play as well, but we can go in quick and deep then into understanding the text and the article on that is by Stephen Cohen, The Quality of Mercy. That's another article that was in Mosaic from Canada that I came across years ago. Very powerful article. Howard's End uh, by E.M. Forster, um, and I've written about that, Only Connect. Tessa the Durbervilles, Thomas Hardy. Uh, I've got two publications on that. And uh, uh, The Reader by Bernard Schlink. I don't know if any of you remember seeing the film of that, uh, but it's also an easy read. And um, that's, uh, there are several articles on that. It, it evoked a lot of um, um, passionate um, debate um, amongst uh, academics. And, um, and I've written about the reader and moral luck on that. So that allows us then to cover a lot of philosophical themes, as well as looking at the uh, uh, texts, we can think about the philosophical themes that they implicate. So with, um, with the Morris Sendak, um, we look at legal philosophy and doctrinal themes um, generally, um, such as uh, um, positivism and natural law, and particularly the idea of socialisation to law. Because actually what Manderson is doing in his article is demonstrating that um, uh, children um, have to be socialised to law in a way that they can identify with, and it really engages with the difference between positivist accounts of law, the Hartian account, and the natural law account. Um, uh, with um, Howard's End, we look at um, economic history. Oh, sorry, no, we do, we do look at that with Howard's End, but with uh, The Merchant of Venice, of course, we're looking at economic history and the difference between common law and equity, and Stephen Cohen's article on that is absolutely fascinating 
because he's a legal historian and he's drawing out how the history of common law and equity is very much dependent on the growth of the merchant classes and the kind of fabulous ideological power battle they then engage with uh, 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 against the sovereign and how the sovereign has to bow in the end to the merchant classes growing power because he's got an interest in the taxation that they can raise through their new commercial success. So there's, there's, there's a very interesting take on the growth of common law there. It, it takes you right into contract law and all the different debates about the virtue of money and so on. Uh, with Howard's End, again, we look at economic matters, but essentially distributive justice, um, the rules and Nozick kind of debate. Um, uh, with Tess of the Durbervilles, as we'll see in a minute, we look at uh, doctrinal constructions of rape and murder. And um, with the reader, we look at the individual responsibility, the Nuremberg defence um, um, argument, and also associated philosophy such as the idea of moral luck, which I, I came across quite by chance and realised that the reader is a wonderful vehicle for thinking of this idea uh, raised by Bernard Williams, the philosopher, of moral luck as well as looking at other ideas throughout all these texts, ideas of free will and ideological trends and so on. So we can cover a lot of jurisprudence by teaching law and literature, and that's partly why I think I've been asked this year by our head of school to double the size of the course. Um, um, <laughs> it's popular, the students love it, and it's a great way to deliver jurisprudence, actually. It makes it much more engaging, I think. And although I had a wonderful jurisprudence tutor myself at Cambridge, the great Nigel Simmons, who also taught me contract law. So I, I, you know, I know the orthodox way can be good, but this way really is um, very compelling, I think. So I'm hoping to move on then and take you quickly through a particular account of one of my favourite, po possibly my favourite text, um, Tessa Durbervilles. And you've got an extract in front of you, you should have an extract in front of you. Um, um, that relates to that. There's a few spare bits of paper down here if you don't have it. She says she's taking over like a teacher, like she's been here for years. <laughs> come along, children, come along here. And um, uh, the text um, is an extract from a critical scene in the book, um, which we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Um, just to give you an overview of the, I don't know how you, well you can see it from over there, but here's a quick synopsis of the whole story. So Tessa Dobervilles by Thomas Hardy, published in 1895, classic English novel of the late Victorian period, a tragedy of urgent themes. It's the story of a young peasant girl, Tess Durbeyfield, ignorant and innocent of sexual matters, who experiences a sexual encounter with Alec Durbeville a local member of the Nouveau Riche. I've really truncated the whole thing there, and I'm careful the, the, with the words I use. She gives birth to an illegitimate child who subsequently dies. Later, she falls in love and marries Angel Clare. By the way, the names are all symbolic. Um, he's supposed to be a clear-thinking um, scientist um, who isn't taken in by uh, prejudice. You know, that's the whole irony of his name. Um, and uh, on their wedding night, he confesses that he had a little moment of madness in London with a woman of easy virtue. And she says, well, I had something happen to me too. And she says, now I can tell you. And she, she's tried to tell him several times, but fate, Hardy's favourite um, um, force, kept in, keeps intervening and stopping that happening. So she tells him what's happened to her, <clears throat> which I'm going to argue to you was a rape. And he just says, oh, that changes everything. I, I did love you, but you're no longer the person I thought you were. Because under Victorian values, that could well have been the case. And it's not just Victorian values, is it, folks? Around the world still today, uh, the um, um, sexual purity of a woman can determine her fate, very much so. So um, he insists that they part, and she falls into total poverty as a result. He goes abroad to South America and um, she falls into poverty, poverty. Destitute, convinced that her husband is lost to her, and hounded by Alec, the man who first um, uh, uh, undertook this sexual um, encounter, um, she allows him to establish her as his mistress. She thinks her husband's gone forever. Partly because he's also sort of trying to put pressure on her that he can help her impoverished family. Um, but then her husband comes staggering back from South America a couple of years later 
and he's had an epiphany and realised what a fool he's been. But of course, it's all too late by then. Alec, the seducer, rapist, taunts her with the inadequacy of her husband, and she stabs him. And then she and Angel run away together, but they're caught in a wonderful scene on Stonehenge at dawn with the police surrounding the stones. And she's lying there like a sacrificial offering. And uh, she's taken away in hand. There's no trial scene in the book. Don't need it. Because that is what would have happened. And in fact, Hardy was very much influenced, we think, by the actual hanging of a woman called Martha Brown that he witnessed when he was 16. Um, and there's a, an account of how she swung around in the pouring rain on the heath on the gibbet in a very clinging black dress that was more clinging because of the rain and how arousing this sight was for everyone including the young 16 year old Hardy but also how disturbing it was knowing that she had been the victim of domestic violence and that's what had led to her actions it is alleged. Um, so some very interesting background to the story. Now I was, I was also alerted to writing about this uh, text because um, of a paper written by uh, Professor John Sutherland, who was then uh, a professor of English literature at UCL. He's retired now. And uh, he had written uh, a, book, uh, a book looking at great mysteries in English literature. And he looks at uh, the argument, is, is Alec a rapist? So I'm, I'm just mentioned in this uh, slide, I've looked at two uh, aspects of test, the rape or seduction and the uh, provocation and murder um, discussion. So um, we could say then that uh, Tess is taken advantage of, or we might say raped, by her social superior Alec who taunts her and whose attention uh, ruin her reputation and prospects as we've heard with her true love. And in his chapter, Is Alec a Rapist?, Professor John Sutherland suggests that readings of the rape seduction scene, which we have in front of us, that's the text you have in front of you, have been shaped by literary political fashions, culminating for Sutherland. And Sutherland was writing, I think, in the 1980s and 90s about this, in a modern interpretation which favours rape and unfairly demonises the character of Alec Durbeville. This is a quote from Sutherland. She who was seduced in the 1890s is she who is raped in the permissive 1960s, he argues. In other words, he's arguing that once the bloody feminists come along um, in the 1960s, what we all, all have understood perfectly well to have been a seduction, a kind of mutually enjoyable uh, romp, uh, gets turned into rape. That's really what he's arguing. So um, he's looking at this text that you've got in front of you, and he looks at the, uh, the first couple of pages, reviewing the account of the ride on horseback prior to the sexual act, Sutherland concludes, Tess repulses his lovemaking as they ride without ever distinctly denying that she loves him. He is much encouraged by her lack of frigidity, he says. If you look at your first page, uh, um, I'm sure I'm much obliged to you, and are you? She did not reply. Tess, why do you always like, dislike my kissing you? I suppose because I don't love you. And this is a, a peasant girl, and he is her employer and her social superior at the time. So it's very difficult for her to say things outright. You are quite sure I'm angry with you sometimes. Oh, I half feared as much. Nevertheless, he did not object to that confession. He knew that anything was better than frigidity. So this is what Sutherland is referring to. But Sutherland's referencing of it is very um, 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 twisted when you look at the whole context. Why haven't you told me when I've made you angry? You know very well why. Because I cannot help myself there. In other words, I'm a person of lowly position. I can't go telling you what to think and what not to think and what I feel and what I don't feel. So Hardy, as you saw from the slide with the, the picture of the front cover of the original text, Hardy entitled his book, Tessa the Devil's A Pure Woman. He subtitled it A Pure Woman for a very particular reason. He wants to tell you a story of a woman who is trapped by her gender, by her social position, um, in a way that is absolutely impossible to escape. And, and even though 
she would be regarded as society as impure, having suffered the sexual encounter, and later having engaged in a killing. Um, he describes her as a pure woman because he's trying to convey a very profound account of how a person can be a good person and get caught up in a concatenation of events that are completely out of their power. So this is the power of this kind of text. And um, there's, I, I mean, actually, I'll have to leave you to read, because we haven't got much time, but I'll have to leave you to read those other pages. But if you turn to the very last page. Um, so he's deliberately taken them into a wood uh, in the night where they're lost um, because he, you know, half, he hasn't maybe planned it, but he's half thought this could be fun to get us both lost and see what happens. And she gets in a panic and he then says, well, look, I'll find out where we are and I'll come back and sort it out. And he leaves her lying in the leaves in the dark and she falls into a deep sleep. If you see Tess, said D'Urberville, there was no answer. The obscurity was now so great that he could see absolutely nothing but a pale nebulousness at his feet, which was represented the white muslin figure he had left upon the dead leaves. Everything else was blackness alike. D'Urberville stooped and heard a gentle, regular breathing. He knelt and bent lower till her breath warmed his face, and in a moment his cheek was in contact with hers. She was sleeping soundly, and upon her eyelashes there lingered tears. Darkness and silence ruled everywhere around. Above them rose the primeval yews and oaks of the chase, in which there poised gentle roosting birds in their last nap. I mean, wonderful literature, if nothing else. And about them stole the hopping rabbits and hares, but, might some say, where was Tess's guardian angel? Where was the providence of her simple faith? Perhaps like that other god of whom the ironical Tishbite spoke, he was talking or he was pursuing or he was in a journey or he was sleeping and not to be awake. Do you see how ironical Hardy is towards the idea of an omnipotent power that is supposed to protect us? Why it was that upon this beautiful feminine tissue, sensitive as gossamer and practically blank as snow as yet, there should have been traced such a coarse passion as it was doomed to receive, doomed to receive. Why so often the coarse appropriates the finer thus, the wrong man the woman, the wrong woman the man. Many thousand years of analytical philosophy have failed to explain to our sense of order. Um, Hardy was virtually self-educated, by the way. Doubtless some of Tess D'Urberville's mailed ancestors, rollicking home from a fray, had dealt the same measure even more ruthlessly towards peasant girls of their time. But though to visit the sins of the fathers upon the children may be a morality good enough for divinities, it is scorned by average human nature, and it therefore does not mend the matter. As Tess's own people down in those retreats are never tired of saying amongst each other in their fatalistic way, it was to be. There lay the pity of it. An immeasurable, immeasurable social chasm was to divide our heroine's personality thereafter from that previous self as hers, who stepped from her mother's door to try her fortune at Tranchard Poultry Farm. So, um, looking at that text, um, um, uh, Sutherland, um, sorry, I'm, ju I'm jumping forward. We've, we've gone past this bit now, showing that um, Tess doesn't love him. Um, Looking at that text, there's no mention of rape. The word rape is not mentioned in the text at all. And, and Sutherland <coughs> charges Hardy, really, with not having used the word rape, and therefore we must assume it was seduction. But the argument really is that um, uh, rape uh, was pretty unsayable in those times. Um, there are textual indications, actually, in, in uh, the book to uh, the idea of sexual in ignorance. So um, Tess makes it clear that she didn't really understand what was happening to her until it, until it was too late. And also the fact that she was sleeping soundly, we're told, and then she, it's kind of this encounter happens. Um, and I, I, the whole argument, mainly Sutherland's argument, that a seduction turns into a rape, the linguistic manipulation, made me look back at the case law. There's plenty of case law from the Victorian period of women who were sexually ignorant and didn't know what was happening to them. There was a case, um, Williams, uh, where a doctor told his female patient, young female patient, that he was performing a surgical operation on her when it was actually intercourse and she didn't know the difference. 
uh, there was another case where uh, uh, a singing master told a young uh, singing pupil that he was performing an operation on her to improve her singing voice. Oh! Um, <laughs> um, and there's case law concerning rape while the subject is asleep. They're going right up to modern times, actually. I mean, there's American and British and other case law demonstrating that some people do sleep very soundly and they only wake up when halfway through something is happening to them. We once had a babysitter like that. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't wake her up to save her life. No, no, no. We came home, though, and we had to virtually carry her home, didn't we? We didn't use her again. The house could have been burning down. She wouldn't have noticed. Um, but so, so there you are. It's a nice demonstration, this, I think, of how you can critique um, a, a text. And it takes you back to thinking about the constructions, the, the linguistic constructions, the linguistic history. Um, and um, as I've mentioned here, um, not only um, was the, the, rape, the word rape difficult to say, um, but also it was pretty impossible for women to raise as well. But also, there's a long a history of case law on seduction. I didn't know that when I first in, uh, started out on it, and I don't know how many of you might know that. But actual case law in Britain and America on the crime and tort of seduction. I think in 23 states in America it was a crime or a tort until the early 20th century. Um, but um, it would be a cause of action on behalf of whom? Anyone want to offer? Who would be the victim? The father, exactly. Because his property and the daughter have been corrupted and ruined. Um, and uh, there's a great quote here, look. An American case, went and Lentz, an action for seduction, defendant had sexual relations with the plaintiff's previously chased 15-year-old daughter and it resulted in her becoming um, incorrigible. She was committed to a home, which is funny until you realise that Scores of women in Britain and in America were committed to mental homes fairly permanently. I mean, I, I can remember cases I heard about in the 1970s of women who were old women who had been committed to mental homes in the 1920s and 30s because they were thought to be moral ret retrobates as a result of losing their virginity before marriage. Um, um, but uh, look at the wording. I just love the wording of this um, account. The defendant's unauthorised interference with the plaintiff's interest was not negligent but intentional and it's commonly recognised both by the law and by public opinion that the risk even of exceedingly unlikely consequences of an unauthorised and intentional interference should fall on the perpetrator rather than the sufferer. If A tramples the valuable plants in B's garden, it is no defence that he reasonably mistook them for weeds. That's the girl, in case you haven't noticed. She's the weed who he mistook for a flower for a moment there. So it, it beautifully, actually there's some other wonderful case law on this sort of point that we haven't got time to go into now. But again, it shows you how you can link up the law and literature and legal history and bring new insights into the matter. We're getting short of time. So arguably, then, Sutherland is simply unwittingly replicating the very prejudices that we're trying to move away from and um, um, using this opposition of uh, the idea of rape and seduction linguistically is completely misleading um, when you look at the actual uh, facts of what happens but it's a way of marginalizing complainants and it's a common ploy used by defense counsel um, Canadian Criminal Code, of course, it's very relevant to your code because you got rid of the word rape some years ago and uh, this is causing trouble. I did a little bit of looking on the, on the net before I came um, and it's still causing difficulty because by getting rid of the term, which I'm sure you did for the best possible reasons to try to get over the taboo of the word um, and assist complainants, you've actually got a reduction in uh, successful charges at that level. So look, 98% um, of charges um, uh, accounts for the least severe form of sexual assault um, 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 charge being brought. So, uh, you know, it's played into the hands of the opposition, apparently. Um, I'll let you look more into that. I've got a reference if you want it. And um, uh, here's an article from uh, just a few weeks ago. 
um, in the uh, Toronto Sun. Um, <laughs> Perhaps not the best source, I don't know, but uh, long-time criminal lawyer Gary Barnes remembers the day before the rape charge was replaced by sexual assault. And, um, um, you know, he argues that um, there, are, there are benefits as well as disbenefits, but there are others lobbying for the word to be brought back in Canada. And it's all about the power of the word, isn't it? It's all about the taboos. And a good advocate needs to understand those things. And I would argue to you that law and literature is a fabulous way to arouse people's sensitivities to the linguistic nuances as well as the philosophical nuances of words and concepts in law. Um, so, um, there are complex linguistic and semiotic and cultural prejudices uh, um, underpinning many crimes. And um, there you are, little, little homily there about the Canadian notion of assault for, to end on that point. Now, we're not going to have time to look at tests and provocation and murder, um, I don't think. Uh, but I do make a connection in my writing about tests and provocation and murder, if you're interested, with a, a very famous English case, English law case, uh, of um, Kiranjit Aluwalia who was sentenced and convicted uh, uh, of, of murder initially after she killed her abusive husband. And those of you who are um, uh, familiar with the problems with provocation law from a feminist perspective particularly will know that the problem with the doctrine um, around the world really and especially in Anglo-American law has been the artificial grafting of a masculine paradigm onto the feminine um, victim turned perpetrator um, which she can't live up to because um, women don't act in hot blood uh, they have to wait because they're usually smaller and weaker than the man they often have to wait until he's asleep before they um, act they're often in um, a very disturbed state of mind anyway and the uh, classical um, doctrine of provocation doesn't map well onto those sorts of circumstances. Hardy understood that, I'm just trying to jump forward, sorry we haven't got, he understood about um, dissociative mental states, look Angel had a vague consciousness of one thing that it was not clear to him till later that his original test had spiritually ceased to recognise the body before him as hers, her own body, allowing it to drift like a corpse upon the current in a direction dissociated from its living will. That's a quote from Tess. Here's a quote from uh, Aluwalia. Other neighbours rushed to the house. This is after she set fire to her husband and she's in the burning house with her child inside the house. They found the door locked and saw the appellant standing at a ground floor window clutching her son, just staring and looking calm. They shouted to her to get out of the house. She opened a window and said, I am waiting for my husband, and closed the window again. She was prevailed upon to hand the child out and later emerged herself. She stood staring at the window with a glazed expression. Now, after the first conviction of her for murder, there was eventually a retrial of the case, partly as a result of the fact that dissociative states dissociative mental states, um, battered woman syndrome, had become admitted to the clinical register and therefore could be recognised um, as evidence in the case. Um, um, so Hardy had kind of anticipated that concept and that linguistic association almost exactly a hundred years before, which I think is pretty remarkable, really. And uh, I see um, you, there's a slide there that explains the problems we're still having with that law, although we've tried to reform it in England and Wales. And um, I understand that you've got difficulties in the US, Canada and Australia with the same um, issue as well. So um, I'm speeding up because we're running out of time. Uh, but um, I just wanted to make the point really, associating things with the Canadian law um, that um, visionary white writers, you know, they're not just English, they're not just American, they're Canadian as well. And as you know, you've got great, great writers, Alice Munro, Margaret Atwood, who, who are managed to communicate otherwise unsayable gender and social territories. And I, I've been drawn, not just because of coming here, but because of another um, thing that happened recently, into looking at First Nation writers. Uh, such as Eden Robinson. Has anybody read any Eden Robinson? 
powerful stuff right in your face. I love her. She's great. And um, um, she is communicating um, some, some real difficulties, again, of that total powerless trap that people in certain social and economic circumstances can find themselves in, which make making the wrong choices almost impossible to avoid. And that's a very important philosophical point for lawyers to um, recognise. That's partly why that book's called Trap Lines. It's, it's a nice play on the word. Uh, another writer I've been reading um, just over the last couple of days, she's a North American writer who is a part uh, North American Indian, Louise Erdrich, The Roundhouse, which is part of a, a tribal um, 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 arrangement. The Roundhouse is where they have tribal uh, um, rituals and so on. And that book is looking at a rape. Um, but looking at it where there is a conflict between tribal law and domestic state law. So again, a wonderful way in to rethinking um, about these problems of law. I note that the web recounts that uh, one of Dean Horacy Reed's early female students, Bertha Wilson, went on to create the Battered Women's Defence as well as being a notable judge. So you've got a direct connection here in this law school with reforming that very difficult area of law. So um, the main point I want to make to you then is the value of law and literature, I believe, is it allows you to engage with philosophical issues that jurisprudence may make rather um, 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 abstract and removed from the direct understanding of how those ideas engage with real lives. It helps you reconnect those things. And um, it also uh, allows you to think outside of the boundaries of normal doctrinal formulae um, to um, unsayable things that need to be said and allow us as advocates to perhaps rethink how we say them. Um, so, conclusions then. Law, law's an artefact. That's always a shocking thing for me to say to second year undergraduates. Hey, we just made it all up, folks. It's not real. Um, uh, it's a cultural and political um, artefact. Uh, there's an argument about whether it's political, of course, but it, you can't avoid the fact that it has political um, elements to it. It's an elaborate edifice. It's a valuable symbol. It's a great institutional power. It's a real entity. I mean, it's a real entity in that sense that uh, it operates in our lives. It has institutional buildings, professionals, and so on, um, and has real findings which impact on lives. Um, but we, we mustn't over, um, um, over worship it because it is our creature, after all, for us to change. Um, it's not um, a forensic tool, as much as it claims. It's somewhere between a science and an art, especially in the construction of um, um, uh, rhetoric, which is very much more powerful than lawyers would like you to believe. Um, and it's a combination of fact and value, and the crossing between fact and value is often not properly uh, referenced. And it has readings of human nature and psychological characteristics and normative values which are often more fluid than they want to recognise. Literature is a series of thought experiments. It's a good way to think about it. Actually, that's how I got into writing about uh, moral luck and the reader, um, recognising that literature is a series of thought experiments. It's a good tool for legal education because it, it expands vocabularies, expands minds, and uh, recognising links between philosophy and law. Uh, doctrinal material and bigger ideas like justice, fairness, truth, what it is to know something or have willed something. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.